without individuals, nothing changes. Without institutions, nothing lasts. And you know, that's why I like to see Jordan as John the Baptist too, because John the Baptist was about starting people on a path of individual repentance, and then the collectives would come later. Uh, and like individual change won't change won't happen un, unless individuals are willing to change. But nothing huge will last if you don't build actual institutions. How might we make sense of symbols in the modern world? What is the role of men as fathers and leaders in today's society? And how can tradition help us to live more meaningful and richer lives? Welcome to Manifesto. This is my interview with JP Marceau. If you like what we're doing, then please like and subscribe. Let's rock and roll with this. All right. Welcome. I'm here with uh, Jean-Philippe Marceau, which I'm sure I've said completely wrong because I'm a British man and my French is fucking okay. It's okay. Thanks. <laughs> this is the the first episode I'm doing as part of the Manifesto YouTube channel and indeed a uh, podcast. Uh, I'm Owen Cox. I've also got a podcast called Techno Social. Um, yeah, Jean-Philippe, JP, welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> nice one. Yeah, I think so. We're going to dig into symbolism today and also kind of connecting symbolic perspectives to to our understanding of masculinity and especially 21st century masculinity. Um, but what I'd like to do first to kick it off, which is something I intend to do in all of the episodes, is actually ask you this question. Like, If there was one man from history who you could sit down with and have a conversation with, who would it be? And what would you like to talk about? Yeah, I'm not sure what you would talk about precisely, but for sure, I feel like it's almost cheating to say this, but I would like to talk with Jesus, of course, but people were so generally confused by what he was saying, like they couldn't never control him. He kept just throwing them off guards in all kinds of ways. Um, even like the apostles who spent years with them, uh, years with him, they only seem to get it like sometime around they only seem to get it at Pentecost, and it was like after you know, one to three years plus uh, however months. Uh, so I don't know what you would talk about. I would have no control, I think, over the conversation, but I think it would be the most interesting one. <laughs> well, I get that vibe, you know, from reading bits of the Bible. Jesus is a bit like one of those old school spiritual teachers who constantly talks in stories and parables to teach people things. And so you'd come to him with some kind of stuff <laughs> and he'd laugh and then tell you a long winding tale about fish and bread or whatever. That, I mean, if it's the modern world, maybe about motorcycles or something and you've no idea where you wind up. Yeah. I, I would be immediately, I think very confused that would, you, you would say, and then it's probably a sort of stuff that would unfold over time where you know, th those stories live with us and they keep giving meanings over months and years. So I suspect this is what would happen, even if it's just one conversation. I think it would like be super dense and keep having impacts over time. Like, I mean, the parables that he told his disciples and also the parables that he lived himself, like the story that he he, he brought people into, uh, like has kept unfolding through time in ways that like just keep become clearer with time. But at, at the moment he was saying these things and doing these things, people were just always so confused. So I would I would expect the same thing from me. A conversation, sort of just in a microcosm. Mm. Are there any particular parables of his, or particular kind of instances of him telling a parable to a disciple that have stuck with you? Yeah, there are several. One that I find funny and I thought about yesterday was a. Uh, there was a really weird moment. Uh, I think it's in John's Gospel, where he. So he's been doing miracles for a while, and I think he's uh, at the temple or something for a feast. And you know, most, mostly he's been interacting with, with Jews, like the lost people of Israel. That's the people he's trying to save. And some also with some heretics like the Samaritans. He hasn't interacted too much with people outside of, let's say, the Judaic story. But you know, isn't the Roman Empire that has conquered like Greece and Judea and a bunch of, of kingdoms. So there are Greeks around and they're curious about Jesus. So they, they come uh, like a few, they come and they ask the, the apostles to speak about Jesus. And then, so the apostles just go to Jesus and they ask him, okay, well, th those Greeks would like to, to speak with you. Uh, can you uh, do, like, can you speak to them? And rather than just sort of going and, and seeing them, he says something that seems completely 
he goes on a kind of crazy story. He tells them that, uh, I think it's, it's the point where he tells, he tells them, unless a uh, seed falls to the ground and dies, it uh, bears no fruit. And then go, he goes uh, into sort of a story about the sacrifice that you will have to go through. And it's a, it's a rich, I think it illustrates the kinds of shocking things that he would say and the way he would throw people off. But you can keep gathering meaning from this because it's, it's what happened ultimately. Like he was able to bring even like the Greeks into the Christian story, but he did have to do it by dying. Like it was by this weird sacrifice that Christ did, this weird surprising sacrifice of himself to the... So he, he, he submitted himself to his religious authorities who wanted to, to, to crucify him because he was uh, an heretic. He also uh, was crucified by the, the Romans because they were worried that he was going to start a revolt or something and they didn't want to... Yeah, I mean, the, the Jews were having all, all kinds of issues, so they were willing to, to kill him too. So you have this idea that you have both the religious and the civil authorities who want to, to crucify him. Uh, but by submitting himself to that, he eventually... Like ended up reforming both and taking over almost the entire world by now. So it's really sort of this strange death of someone innocent that pierced the veil, pierced like showed how corrupt, let's say, the religious authorities had become, showed how uh, evil in many ways the Roman Empire was. That ended up subverting, subverting it really from below. It was a bunch of victims in the Roman Empire, mostly like the uh, widows, orphans, uh, poor people, and so on, who associated with this this story after his resurrection and were really emboldened to keep talking about it and were more happy generally than the other Romans and, and uh, the other people that were around. So this story became like super powerful, ended up really like flowering into something huge. So like the, the grain, uh, the seed that falls into the ground that Christ just mentioned when the, the, the Greeks seem to just we just want to talk to you, like, what's going on? And he goes into the story about him having to die to ultimately bring in the Greeks. That, that's how he really did it, but it was by no means obvious when, when he said it. So it's one of those, uh, yeah, just one of those that's on my mind, but Chris said so many things, and he did so many weird things too, that, yeah. But on top of my head, yeah, that's the one that, that sticks to me most. I don't know if you, you, you said that you read some, like, what's one that you, you yourself find interesting? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, because I'm not a Christian, I haven't found myself like reflecting that much on uh, on Christian teachings. But what's coming to my mind, funnily enough, now is that story about feeding the five thousand with the fish and the bread. Probably because I already mentioned it. Um, <laughs> but I'm actually not super sure of what the context of that story is. I mean, is the basic idea that like with faith miracles are possible so with faith 5000 could be fed with this tiny amount of food the two a kind of a rational understanding would be totally absurd yeah i think there there is a few instances when he multiplies loaves and fishes um but i i wrote i wrote an article about miracles in the symbolic world not too long ago and there are different kinds of of miracles um C.S. Lewis wrote a really brilliant, brilliant book about this, uh, titled Miracles. And what I think you, the, the point of faith is important, um, but I think it's within something more overarching. It's, it's about bringing people into higher level patterns. And it, the basic idea is that if you look, whenever something higher acts through something lower, things will look weird when you look at it at the lower level. So uh, when, let's say, I, I made the decision to speak, speak these words that I'm saying right now, if, we're, if you were to look at it at the level of my brain, it would look super weird, like all kinds of weird connections that seem super improbable. Like, what are the odds that I will like fire my neurons the, the good way so that my, my lips move just the way they do, that my, my, uh, my throat, my lungs, and so on move just the way they do so that I say these words rather than just something random. Because, I mean, if you were to just look at this level, like you would expect something random. But if you look at it at the higher level, uh, at the level of, let's say if you, you take modern cognitive science and you associate the mind, you don't have to like say that it's something immaterial. You just have to say that, okay, the mind as a 
a complex system, a complex irreducible system of not only complex connected neurons in, uh, in, in, in a body, but also within an environment. This whole irreducible thing, if you look at it, the way it acts top down, the way it constrains all of the potential ways that my, my mouth could move, that my different neurons could fire, the, this kind of overarching sets of constraints is what will shape the words that I do. And if you look at this, these constraints, it makes sense that I actually say these words. Like if you look at the higher, you can now explain the, the weird emergence that seems to happen at the lower levels. So, and this, this is true at different layers in, in, in reality. You have the same kinds of thing happening, let's say at the lower levels of physics, that if you just look at what happens at the lower layers and you see things emerging out of potential, it's not much of an explanation, but once people get to see, let's say, certain laws that we've studied that, okay, this governs the way things emerge and we're happy with this kind of emergence. And the same kind of things happens with, with Christ's miracles. Uh, they're just at the highest level where you have a pattern, you have a, a cosmic pattern where the idea is that creation has been separated from its creator by, by sin, by, by all kinds of bad, bad, bad things. And now you will try to reunite this. So you need to bring the lower into the higher again. And the way that Christ does it will of course look miraculous because you're just trying to bring something lower into something higher. Some things, so these things will only make sense within a theological context. And so the overarching kind of miracle is, you can call it the, 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 the grand miracle as Lewis does. It's the, the incarnation, death and resurrection. It's the whole cycle that sort of brings the lower back into the, the higher. And within that grand miracle, you'll see different kinds of, of miracles, including the miracles of the loaves and fishes, which you just mentioned. And the loaves and fishes are, they're, they're a miracle of the old creation. That's the way Lewis puts it. It's, it's a normal pattern for loaves and fishes to multiply. Uh, it's just not normal that do it as quickly as Christ did it. But you know, every year fishes multiply into the rivers. Every year, if we plant seeds, they will grow back again. They, they will make more, more bread. Uh, we can bring creation like fishes and loaves to participate into this pattern by just tending to fishes or um, planting seeds. This, this will happen. Uh, now in the case of Christ, doing this sort of in a microcosm, it shows it, uh, different miracles will accomplish different things, but the miracles of the old creation where Christ does things like multiply loaves and fishes, that, that's a normal pattern of creation, but by doing them very quickly, he's illustrating that he's the higher coming down into the lower and he's doing what the higher always does. Like every year this sort of stuff happens, but as the creator, as the origin of all that stuff, Christ is able to do it much faster. So he does something that is continuous with the way that nature works. Like he doesn't really break, break stuff. Uh, he, even if you look at, let's see, um, modern kinds of physics, like it's possible that weird quantum things will happen, that things will appear. Like there's potential for all kinds of strange things to manifest. They, they don't typically do, it's very improbable, but it's still possible. And the idea is that by the IS coming down, he can, bring potential into patterns that they would typically do, just not as fast as he does it themselves. He does this to bring people into a story where you see the VIS coming down into the lowest. And then later he will do other kinds of miracles where he will shift from just recap recapitulating things. So there, there are several miracles of those creation. Like there's the loaves and fishes we just mentioned. There's also the, it's the virgin birth, because this is, this is like the Big Bang, or this is like a creation happening at every instant. At every instant, um, God sustains the world in being. The fact that uh, then you can go into all kinds of classical arguments, but things are contingent around us. Like they don't have to exist by themselves. Uh, if you look at the, I don't know, the, the, these glasses here, well, they, they exist because they're, the, the, the molecules in there exist, because the atoms in there exist, because the particles in there exist, but ultimately, all of these things exist because they're sustained in being by, by some kind of ground of being uh, and that just God. So this kind of creation of everything out of nothing happens at every instant. So the, the virgin birth is just like a microcosm of this. It's like the big bang, you know, creating the world out of nothing. Well, you just do it in, in sort of one instance. So there are all kinds of miracles like this of the old creation. And then Christ would also do miracles of the new creation where he, he brings older patterns 
uh, it brings sort of the world into patterns that have never happened before, but that is trying to, to make the world confirm in two from now. So let's say when he walks on water, that's not a normal pattern in current creation, but what the creator is doing in this is, is showing a new way in which, let's say, meaning and fact will, will agree. Right now, for instance, my, my head, I talked about how my mind, a set of overarching constraints will shape the potential from my, my, my body. But the idea with the sea crust walking on water is to take this further, where our mind will not only shape our own body, but will even shape things outside of our environment to a degree that they don't currently do, uh, like water, like us being able to walk on water. So it will be transfigured, ultimately will be resurrected with a new kind of strength body. So the I really went off a, a huge tirade about miracles right now, but like the context for the loaves and the fishes is, is really like huge. It's a part of a huge story and it's only by taking so sort of this whole story, like the higher level pattern, that you can start to make sense of the little things. Like the way that I move my lips right now, to make sense of it, you need to know the overarching pattern of our conversation and my mind within it. But it's similar for the miracles that Christ will do. They make sense within the overarching theological story of the, the, the creator coming down into the creation to bring him back into it, uh, himself. So the, and faith has an important role to play in this. It could, it, it will say in a few times, for instance, that uh, Chris didn't perform miracles when he went back to uh, uh, his own city because people didn't have faith there, so he didn't do many miracles there. I think he said maybe he did like a few exorcisms or, or something, but it seemed like he, he did something very small in comparison to what he typically does. And that's because the goal wasn't to overwrite current creation, to, to sort of delete it and then create something new. The goal was to make something new out of something that already exists to, let's say, bring the current patterns to their highest level in the same way that you multiply loaves and fishes. That's something natural to creation. They're just brought to a higher, higher level of fruition in Christ's miracles. Well, if we are willing to jump into the story, then we're like the loaves and fishes who are getting handled and brought into the higher level pattern. So faith is an important part of it. And Christ illustrates it in his miracles where he always likes, he, he always takes into account the faith of the people. If they don't have faith, like you won't, you won't do it. Like he doesn't want to just delete creation and start over. Like the goal is to create good out of something that already exists. It is to bring back something that has fallen. Mm. I'm really curious now to try and start connecting some of these themes to the work that we're doing in manifesto and on the, uh, the men's movement more broadly, because it's only what's in my mind, this idea of, the seed and the seed that must die, that it must bear fruit. And indeed what you were saying as well about how the bread multiplies itself or the fish multiplies itself. This sense of the kind of cycle of death and rebirth, I think is so key to us. And I think it is one of the, the universal patterns, if you will. And it's certainly right in the middle of the Christian teaching. And it reminds me of one of the most significant events in the landscape of contemporary masculinity, which was this explosion of Jordan Peterson onto the cultural scene, who had, amongst other things, this kind of core message for men of take on some responsibility, stop thinking about the world just in terms of rights and what you're entitled to, but actually what you can take ownership of and what you can create if you choose to orient yourself towards existence in such a way. And you also brought back into, I think, the, if not mainstream, at least quite public discussion, ideas of, of God and the transcendent, and indeed this notion of, of sacrifice. And, you know, what we saw around 2017, 2018, and like we were saying beforehand, I think we were both quite touched by this moment as well, is that it was like a, it was fucking powerful. Like, I can remember hearing his his lessons and thinking, fuck, like, I've never heard anything like this before, or at least I've not heard it coming from someone who I actually had enough faith in what they were saying that I took it to be true. And I kind of grew up as a very nihilistic, rebellious kid 
involved in heavy metal and then like drug scenes and hippie scenes. And my basic attitude to reality was this shit is fucked. What's the fucking point? I might as well just try and have a good time while I'm doing it and don't partake in anything because it's already so hopelessly corrupt that I would just sully myself by studying hard or trying to get a, uh, a good job in the classical sense. But hearing Jordan Peterson and it's like, oh, fuck. Actually, yes, perhaps shit is mad fucked, but there is something that you can do about it if you want to try and pull your shit together and make some of these sacrifices. If you want to try and be the seed, perhaps, that lets some of itself die so that it can bear fruit. And again, this idea of death and rebirth, it's also a notion that I've explored a lot with my friend Kadel Last, who's constantly talking about death and rebirth. Or right, so he signs off his emails with this with this signature, die again, die better. This idea being that perhaps a person, we get one flesh and blood death, but we can have many symbolic deaths, if you will. There's always something in our circumstance, something in our in our position, perhaps that we could sacrifice and thus offer up so that we can create or belong to something bigger than ourselves. And I did, I think that is the kind of central notion of, of sacrifice and responsibility. It's like, let go of some of your of desires for whatever is tangible and immediate in the service of something more long-term, more beautiful, and perhaps, and here's where the element of faith comes in, something that you yourself can't even conceive of that is beyond what you know to be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot in there. Um, one thing that comes to mind is I like to see Jordan as John the Baptist. Uh, people don't always know this, even in very Catholic places, like here in, in Quebec, where our sort of saint uh, is um, Saint John the Baptist, but he was a very wild figure. Uh, he, he, he went from the temple, because his, his father was the high priest, he went from the temple and left for the desert. Uh, he only like ate wild locusts and honey, and he, he sort of barely, uh, I think he wore like a, some sheep clothing, or I don't know, he, he, wore, he wore something wild, basically, his hair was all messed up. Uh, and he yelled at people to repent, basically. He brought it down to a very individual kind of level. He didn't have any sort of complex, uh, super complex theology or philosophy. And uh, he also brought things down to a simple level. He said, like, bring low the mountains and uh, level the valleys or something. He, he didn't go into, like, super large metaphysics. He didn't try to build any big kind of groups. Uh, like he had some people who followed him, obviously, but mostly he tell, mostly told people to, to repent and get ready for something bigger, told people that something was wrong. And I think this is like what Jordan is, is doing in many ways. So we, we have a, a failure of, of the temple right now, you can say that the, yeah, John the Baptist was leaving the temple precisely, think, okay, what, what you find out in the city doesn't work. Like people aren't... Uh, living up to the responsibilities that they should live up to, whether it be like the spiritual or the intellectual authorities or whatever, there's all kinds of breakdowns, people. But you can start with yourself to, to, to repent and build something like individually. And then sometime later, something will come that will build bit bigger and better uh, organizations. And I think a reason why Jordan has been successful in doing this is because he, he really seems to embody it. Um, on the one end, I think there's like just the, there's, I think it's meaningful that he, on the one end, he has a, a family that he, and he has a good family that he has kept together, even with the, like all kinds of troubles. I don't know if you read his uh, 12 Rules for Life, but I think it's in the last chapter when he talks about, especially the illness of his, his, his daughter. And it's, it's really impressive, like how he has kept the family together through all this. And even later, after you learn about like his own struggles with depression, uh, and like if you are, so there's the fact that yeah, on the one end, he's like he did keep his 
family together virtuously. Uh, there's also the fact that he has had a very successful career, including you know in his clinical practice where he has to actually help people. And we don't have data like on his clients, but just from the anecdotes that he tells of his clients, you can tell that he cares. You can tell that he like that he's been successful at his job uh, in his research and so on. So he, I think he's a good. So on the one hand, he's willing to tell people that they have issues that they should repent, like John the Baptist, but he also exemplifies a way forward to, okay, well, I mean, take care of your career, of your you know, other family, take care of, of your family, and then bigger and better things will emerge from there. But we don't have to just, like, stay stuck, uh, I guess, in the desert, yelling at people that everything is going to shit and that's it. Like, there's, there is a way forward that he exemplifies. John the Baptist was pointing to Christ, for instance. Well, th there's going to be something coming soon, just a few months later or something, okay? But in the case of Jordan, like, he starts exemplifying it within himself. Well, you can try to go on the same path that, I, that he has tried. And, so he, and on my end, you know, I, I really need sort of metaphysical answers to questions. Like, I can't just leave it at the, like, Jordan's pragmatism. So I had to work through, let's say, the, the metaphysical implications of, of what he says. Uh, but that can come later. You know, the fact that he was exemplifying something attractive was, was well enough for me to get started. And then uh, in parallel, I was doing my, my graduate studies in philosophy. So I had plenty of time to work through the metaphysics. And it's like, on the one, he gets people inspired. He points on the issues, gets people inspired. And then people can work through the other issues. I guess. Make sense? Yeah, for sure, man. And I think, I think perhaps where, where I feel like Jordan falls short was his complete focus on individuality. I think he kind of got caught up in perhaps what is his, he's like a Protestant preacher, if you will. It's like all about the individual and Protestantism, as far as I can understand it, is very much about the individual's relationship with God, far more so than say Orthodox or Catholicism, which relates more like your your spiritual path your religious experience is mediated more through your connection with the church and the religious community and i think it led peterson or leads him to to a focus on on like like individual empowerment to try and get through their shit which is i think is an important step but i don't think it is the ultimate way for it's only a first step i think we are such interpersonal creatures that so many of our of our problems of our paradoxes must be worked out in communion in in dialogue in dialectic it's, it's exactly why why therapy is effective and why increasingly like we're finding in the men's movement things like men's movements are effective men's circles are effective just having a space where you can come and basically tell the other guys what's happened this week what's happened today and explore what do you feel like your purpose is where do you get shame from what are the contradictions in your relationship and then hearing through what other guys reflect on that and their own experiences starting to realize that the difficulties and paradox and struggles that you as a man or indeed as a person face are not just local to you yourself. And there's this strange, almost miraculous effect that just bringing them into the light of discussion and consideration with other people does something to kind of loosen the chains that wrap you up around them. And I felt like Peterson didn't really go enough in that direction. He wound up being quite a proponent of this kind of American individualism kind of self-help. You can do it yourself by pulling your shit together. And I, I think the unfortunate thing is, is that in another world, perhaps his message wouldn't have gone so far down that path, but he was so, so adamant on perhaps fighting against the collectivist political ideologies like fascism and communism that he spent so much time studying that he'd led himself to this conclusion that individuality is the remedy against them. And I think it's more like individuality is the way to break out of what you might call a pathological collectivity, but then there needs to be a return of a kind of an aware and embodied individual back into a community in which they can exist, in which they no longer experience themselves as the center and like authority of existence and are able to share that with others around them. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. There's a, a good quote by uh, Paul Van der Klee. Uh, I don't know who he took it from, but I'm pretty sure he took it from someone. And the quote is, without individuals, nothing changes. Without institutions, nothing lasts. And you know, that's why I like to see Jordan as John the Baptist too, because John the Baptist was about starting people on a path of individual repentance, and then the collectives would come later. Uh, and like individual change won't change won't happen un, unless individuals are willing to change. But nothing huge will last if you don't build actual institutions. Yeah. So I think like Jordan is great at doing this first step of individual repentance. But at least like in the work that he has currently done, uh, yeah, I do agree that he. I see. If he was to just sort of stop there completely it will it would fall, fall short at the very least you would have to point to something that will work like uh or okay maybe he has done this sort of implicitly i don't know but you have to at least point out to the fact that something of an institution will that will work will will come later you can just sort of leave people into individual individualism and as you said even for change to take place within an individual over a long period, you will need to join some kind of other institution. Like if you just try, it's super difficult. Like maybe some people with like very special temperaments can can go off on their own and sort of be hermits. It happens. There are hermits, and there are even hermits who have done great things. Like people who there are all kinds of, of stories in uh, in the Catholic Church and also in the Orthodox Church of people going to be hermits for like 20, 30 years, and then they come back and they bring all kinds of, of good things to the community. There. Like people who try to be hermits and they were followed by monastic by people who would then become monks and they would find all kinds of monasteries who would then help like keep civilization together as it collapses or will uh, uh, welcome all kinds of pilgrims. So it it can it can happen. Some people are really uh, like I guess built to be hermits and maybe that's kind of Jordan's case. But over the long run, I don't think it can really like stay there. Uh, you know, we talked about the the seed that uh, that falls to the ground and dies before something else is reborn and like the, the, the rep repentance part the individual part is the first part of this you have to like be willing to to die to your own self to all of your issues and then something better will emerge uh, and typically this emergence will happen within like within a group even even to be able to let bigger parts of yourself die you have to know that you'll fall back on on something like and people will be able to point out your faults and so on. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with what you said about Jordan, basically. It, it all fits within the pattern of seeing him as, as John the Baptist who is preparing people for something that will come collectively later. Mm. So this is super interesting because this brings me to the uh, the topic of patriarchy, which is something we're exploring a bunch in Manifesto. In fact, one of the 10 principles is the virtuous patriarchy. Obviously, patriarchy is a word that is a very dirty word at the moment. It's it's a kind of staple of feminist critique that society is and has been patriarchal and has repressed femininity and denied them access to full political subjectivity, to full sexual subjectivity, and so on and so on. But the word patriarchy itself is actually, I mean, it's like, it's a beautiful word. It comes from these Greek words, patros, I think, which is father and archon, which is leader. And so put together, it's like the leadership of the fathers or indeed the institution of fatherhood within society and how they act as leaders. And I think this is precisely where in Manifesto, we're interested in like reclaiming and like rediscovering what it means to actually consciously be part of a patriarchy and experience one's life, one's vision, one's mission as constructing a, a virtuous patriarchy, if you will, one that is invested in sustaining not just those people who are part of it now, but also the next generations and the generations to come. And also balancing this alongside with an equally powerful and virtuous matriarchy, the same thing, but for women, which is not something we need to talk about too much today because we're men and we're focusing on the patriarchy side. But I just throw that out there because this is where thought is going, I think. It's like once men realize that there's only so much that you can get out of life by living 
as an individual and chasing after your own desires, chasing after sexy women and pretty things, there comes a point of, well, what comes next? And Mm -hmm. for many people, that is taking the step towards fatherhood. It's not something that I've done or that I (laughs) consider myself anywhere near, but but I see it. And then there's also the element of, I think Father Michael Butler, who's one of the guys involved in Manifesto, was saying the other day, there's this step from just being a biological father to having to be the father of one kid or two kids or whatever, to then being a father within the community, to stepping forwards to coaching the league football or baseball or whatever it is, to to taking a responsibility for the shared upbringing of 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 all of the people within the community. And I think this is where to begin these conversations now about what it means to have like a patriarchy and a matriarchy, an institution of adults who are invested in the long term and not just in themselves or in their own children's success and in, in in pure materialistic enrichment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, one thing, one kind of image that can be useful here, I think, is to see how. See, I'm going to speak with like the what I know in let's say traditional Christian countries. You would have this at different layers of reality. People, uh, this idea that there is a healthy patriarchy matriarchy relationship at all layers. So let's say uh, in in a marriage, I think it was Augustine who said that um, the the husband is the the head of the household, and the woman, the wife, is the the heart of the household. And so you have this idea of okay, you have some let's say explicit authority in the patriarchy, and you have some implicit authority in the matriarchy. Some, and you'll find this at different layers. A very cool image within the biblical narrative is you have this relationship between uh, Peter and uh, John. Ultimately, they're both brought together in Christ Himself. Was sort of androgynous, but in uh, in Peter and John, you have those two sides. So you have Peter, who is the the head of the apostles, who uh, will sort of make decisions, will lead people, will will sacrifice himself for everyone, like he'll be he'll be a martyr. Uh, but who also is, I guess, blind. Like his focus also can make him blind to let's say the the implicit worth of uh, of different things. And on the other end, you'll have John, who is more the, the implicit authority in all this. And there are different scenes. For instance, uh, during the, the Last Supper, when um, you know, Christ is explaining, you can see this, I think, most clearly in the, the Gospel of John. It's not, I don't know if it's during the Last Supper, supper during, anyways, doesn't matter, but during uh, a supper where Christ says that he's going to be betrayed by, by someone, uh, the apostles want to know. So Peter, who is the head of the apostles, sort of, okay, then let, let's ask. But he doesn't ask Christ himself directly. He asks John. John is uh, sort of the youngest apostle. Uh, he's referred to as the, the apostle uh, that Jesus loves. He's not even named in the Gospel of John. Like, he's implicit. <laughs> he's really sort of a, a hidden uh, kind of uh, authority. But he's leaning on the breast of Christ, and he asks Christ who will betray him. And then sort of Christ will answer to everyone. So you have this idea that the, the implicit uh, power, John here, will be the one, he, he has the implicit power, while Peter has the explicit power. And there, you'll see this in different examples in, in the Gospels, and I don't want to spend too much time laying it out. I can l- l- let people find these gems themselves, I think. It's mostly in, in John's Gospel that you find this, but basically when you have this good relationship between the explicit and the implicit, let's say the patriarchal and the matriarchal, you'll, have a, you'll see the magic happen, basically. And within the church, the church did this at different layers. Uh, so often uh, you would, there are several funny instances where, let's say the explicit authority of the church, let's say the bishops, the priests, and so on, would be having some fights. Like they'd be trying to, to solve something. The people in explicit authority would be trying to solve some, something, uh, sort of, Top down, a very masculine kind of way of, of doing things, or they, they want to sacrifice themselves for the community somehow, but you know they, they have to figure out how to do it. And to to help them do this, they will consult with some ascetics, some people who have some hidden kind of of power. Uh, so, for instance, in in one of the early councils, I don't remember which one, but like a bunch of bishops and priests that spent like months drafting something, 
And then to make sure that it was right, they went to see, um, I think it was Saint Simeon, who was an ascetic who lived on a pillar. Like he spent his whole life living on a pillar, like I don't know, a very small pillar just living there. But people kept flocking to him because he had all kinds of wisdom, even though he had no explicit authority. Like it was just some, some not even in the church hierarchy, like some guy standing on a pillar. And, but because people recognized like the sainthood, the sainthood in that person, they would flock to him, ask him for advice and something. So he would end up having all kinds of implicit authority. Like he was able to discern value and things and people would go to him for advice. So after their council, like the bishops and priests and so on, they went to check with Saint Simeon to make sure that what they had drafted was, was okay. And uh, in, in cathedrals in Europe, you would often have like, um, I don't remember what they're called. They, like some people would often like literally live in a small cell within the cathedral. Like they would not live there, like the, the ascetics, they just keep like stay there and pray. And you know, in the cathedral, you would have a bishop sort of with the implicit power, but the bishop would often speak with the person living in the cell because they had all kind of implicit spiritual wisdom. And it would often be, let's say, just some very devout woman just do, doing a rosary all day or whatever. And you had this marriage with, of the implicit and the explicit. And of course, in a, in a family, that's, that's how things work properly. Like the man, as St. Paul says, that the man is the, the head of his wife, the head of the family. So what he has to do is to listen to what his body is saying. Like, well, are the, the children fed, pro pro fed properly this way? Is there an issue with the house, whatever? And it's the, the wife who is much more attuned to these things. Like even like you can see it in the way that children are turned from infants are basically like a mess of competing passions. They, they are, they, they, they barely, like they, they're really chaotic, but they're shaped into personhood by the, their mothers mainly. And the women are great at this. It's amazing. Men can do it too, but especially for young infants, it's, it's extremely impressive what women are able to do. Uh, all kinds of, and psychologists can look at this in slow motion, like how the child does something with his face, the mother can then receive it and respond with something correctly. And over time, this kind of loop will turn the chaotic child into a genuine person. So anyways, the point is that women are really able to pick up on all kinds of patterns and shape them in the way that men are not necessarily able to, uh, but men can listen to those things and then they can make the proper sacrifices. Like they, can, they can work, they, as St. Paul says, they can lay down their lives for their family in the same way that Christ laid down his life for the church. And you know, conversely, the, the wife, the body can you know, bring up all of those concerns and so on to uh, her husband and then she can then respect what he says and apply it. So the, I think we have really good examples within traditional societies of how this, this relationship worked. Uh, and to even bring it back to Jordan, I think it's like one of the reasons why his message was effective is that he was pointing out such a kind of hierarchy as you just laid out. Okay, so you can start by just ordering yourself, like your, your head with your own body. <laughs> start by cleaning your own room, uh, make sure you're healthy and so on. Find something yourself to do. Once you're able to take care of yourself, then you can like, Try to see if you can enter into a relationship with, him, with, with someone else. Like, can you like, have a proper relationship with a, a woman uh, or you know, if you're a woman with a, with a man or whatever? Like, can you like, manage a more complex relationship where there's still one head and uh, one body, but within like, two people? And then if you're able to do that, can you do it within a family? Like, you're, you keep raising the level of abstraction. And you said, uh, once you're able to take care of, of yourself and your family, then you can also start being a, a father to others. You can start to listen to, okay, what are the problems in my community? What can I sacrifice myself to basically? And then you can start to, you know, if you've built up your competence at those other layers, you'll actually be able to do things. Like you'll, you'll really be able to help I don't know, your, your neighbor with this thing or, or, or whatever. And people can just keep ascending and ascending. Uh, so that it's a very sort of inspiring path that's clear. And people can start better way just by setting up their own relationship between their head and their body. Mm. It's interesting. We've got onto this topic of the family. It's, it's starting to remind me of some of the ideas of Alexander Bard, the philosopher who's somewhat attached with the men's movement. So he's got this concept of the phallic intrusion, which he develops out of psychoanalysis. And I think particularly out of, Oh, I forget who, but it's the female psychoanalyst who was working after Freud. It might be, I don't know if it's Klein. It doesn't matter. Anyhow, the point is, is there's this sense that, like you said, the mother and the child 
have like a very powerful relationship, especially in infancy. Like mothers are super in tune to the babies and their needs. I mean, I think there's like incredible studies that have come out about the degree of perceptivity that like baby and mother have to minute changes in things like facial expression or, or um, like, like blood in the cheeks. And, and similarly, if there isn't, that incredibly close attuned relationship between baby and mother in the early years, it actually causes long-term developmental issues for that child because it's precisely in those interactions that it learns some kind of emotional regulation. It's like the baby is a totally useless, powerless, hungry, shitting, screaming machine. And basically the only way that it has that it can be like, okay, actually like, you're not just dying, like (laughs) it's okay, is by that like warmth, that nurturing of the mother and her smiling face and the milk that comes out of her breast, et cetera. But then what the phallic intrusion is, is the position of the father as the third unit in this structure that teaches the baby and indeed the infant that the relationship is not just mum and baby. It's not just this kind of incestuous circle. As Bard sometimes puts it, it's like there is something else that mum desires that isn't you. And you don't exactly understand what it is, but it's it's the grown-up penis that can fuck her because all you can do as a baby is is take from her and give her happiness, but a like kind of like a a symbiotic happiness, whereas the the masculine gives the sex, but also provides the, uh, it, archetypally speaking, provides the household, provides the security, provides the, the material basis upon which mother and baby can do what they do. Mm-hmm. And this phallic intrusion is a necessity for, for the baby, for the child to grow up and achieve what might be called its own mature adulthood. It needs to look at the father and actually desire, I want to be like that. I want to be someone who fucks the women and protects the women rather than just being someone who sucks on the woman's tit, someone who makes the woman smile and makes her happy because I'm cute. And his critique is that actually Western society post the world wars We've really suffered. We've kind of become scared of this phallic intrusion of a masculinity that is too kind of cutting in a sense and have been left with a kind of developmental situation where mothers and children remain too tangled up in each other for for too long. And even the way that our societies are oriented towards people being very nice and respectful of, of each other and never stepping on anybody's toes and not not challenging too much precisely kind of inhibits this development, especially of masculine children towards being a, a healthy kind of a healthy man who is to kind of talk in Peterson's language again. It's like has a sword, but doesn't use it when he's talking about that line, the meek will inherit the earth. It's not like the weak and the cowardly and those who could never hurt anybody who will inherit the earth, but it's those who rather who are warriors, but don't have to be unless absolutely called upon. And I think this, this kind of stitches up very nicely in, in these themes of like patriarchy and sacrifice and responsibility. It's this idea of actually not just getting what you can out of society in the same way that the baby just gets what it can out of the mother, but actually shifting into this, what can I do? What can I create? What can I make? How can I provide and protect? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I've been hearing more and more people speak about this recently, um, of how, I think you can even bring it earlier than the world wars, but probably, yeah, I guess like, I guess you could start at almost any point in history, but you can go really far back. Yes, for instance, in a, you can say that when the, the, the Catholic church lost its masculine role of ordering things correctly and became just super corrupt during the middle ages, it was insane. Like for hundreds of years, like the corruption was crazy. It's, it's really a miracle that it held up for as long as it did. But once the, the Protestant reformation happened, you, because I mean, in large part to counter all of the corruption, 
So because the masculine identity its proper identity its proper role, what we need to see it is that rather than sacrificing themselves for other people, the, the the Vatican was largely just holding things up to itself. So rather than and so rather than sacrifice that you should see at any sort of correctly functioning masculine principle, they were just ordering things up to, with, to themselves tyrannically. So you get the backlash of the Protestant Reformation. And immediately as this happened, you've taken out one, one masculine, so you, you kept taking out, you officially take out, let's see, the one masculine layer of, of reality that was the spiritual authority, and you automatically replace it by the state and remove like the, the bishops and so on, you, you remove some steps. You change the Vatican, replace it by the state, and then you remove some intermediary layers. Now it's just going to be the people and, and the state or the people and God. But you can keep seeing sort of the split happening within, uh, I mean, throughout the centuries where people, people become more and more isolated by themselves and they rely more and more just on the state. And there's sort of no masculine principle in between. Uh, you can even see it in the, the way that cities are, are formed now. Uh, we, it used to be that in the different cities, they would all be built up around the church where the, the priest was the father of that, that town or that city or whatever. You would, would call him father because he had a masculine role. He had to listen to everyone in his parish. Like you, the parish was carrying his body. He had to listen to the cares, the concerns, and then he had to sacrifice himself properly to those concerns. And that's how the cities held together. And the, like the, the priest was literally like the head of the town. You can even see it like where he lives. He lives in the church, which is the highest point in the entire city. But we kept fragmenting this now. And there, we don't have any sort of real authorities now besides just the, the state. And the state has been taking all kinds of masculine roles because of this. So the state is what um, takes care of, uh, of uh, infants in many cases. Uh, in, in some, I think it's mostly a U.S. phenomenon, but it probably happened elsewhere as well. I'm just not familiar enough with it, but the state would give, let's say, so much benefits to single mothers that often, like, fathers have no incentive to stay, and it encouraged all kinds of abandonment uh, of children by, by fathers. It encouraged mothers not to be super responsible, because typically, especially in traditional societies before contraception, women had to be very, very careful who they decide to spend their lives with. So marriage was a very serious affair. And because it was the only way to, uh, you can even see it very dramatically, because marriage was the only, was pretty much the only respectable way to uh, have access to sexual partners. Men had to be virtuous to please women that would actually like be willing to marry them. So it was a, a very sort of strong loop to keep men virtuous, like this whole marriage before contraception thing. But now it's become weird and it's possible for women to be like, careless and even if they get pregnant, the state can take care of it. So the role of fatherhood has in many cases been taken care of by the state. The, let's say the lots of organizations that were taken care of by, by often the religious authorities have been taken care of now by the, the state too. Uh, like the people don't gather uh, for church on Sundays by and large now. They often they do nothing, but like they maybe watch movies or watch the news or whatever stuff that comes from another layer that is more influenced by the government, for instance, you'll have, um, anyways, you, you even like, let's say the healthcare system, rather than being uh, administered by, by the church, uh, and now it's all uh, on the state. So maybe to try and bring it back to what you were saying with, with Bard earlier, uh, we, as we keep like removing layers of masculinity between the individual and the state, now the individual is free to remain sort of a, a child sucking on his mother's breast forever. Basically, people can just keep in their basement and get uh, fed by a very remote government. And it's, we can do that easily right now. Well, precisely. And of course, the issue becomes over time the fact that the government isn't just an abstraction. It needs people to man it. And if you're raising generations that don't have that masculine understanding of themselves and some kind of a drive to pro provide and protect for something bigger than themselves, then eventually the institutions are run by people who themselves are not fully adults. And I think we can see this now in the contemporary political institutions like fucking Donald Trump, 
Boris Johnson here in the UK. It's like, as far as I can tell, like our British Parliament or at least our government, it's like they're a bunch of incompetent kids who don't really know what they're doing. And they've kind of got there because they were people who really, really wanted to be in government rather than people who had a sense of like, I want to, I want to serve and I have a vision for how we're going to serve. It's like, I want to be that guy who's the prime minister. There's this kind of subtle shift that I think happens around positions of power where it's like the position of power is ultimately there to, to dispense with, with resources and protections, et cetera, in a way that, that serves everybody. You get the competence and you get the experience up to the top, but then the power position itself becomes an ideal. And then people want the ideal just for the sake of being the person who attains the ideal. I mean, similarly, I, it happens in all areas of life. Like I, I myself have been through this this kind of stage as a young man of idealizing and wanting to be a philosopher or a writer. But then when I run really picking apart at myself, it's like, do I have anything to say? Or is it just that I want to be a philosopher or a writer to have the kudos of saying, I'm a philosopher, I'm a writer. And a lot of it is the former, or oh, no, the latter, sorry, the latter. I, I do notice as I get older, it's, it shifts more into being like, okay, now maybe I have like a sense of there are things to say and things that I want to say. And I do sometimes wonder if it's actually like a necessary stage in adolescence to have an idealization of a position of power, to be like, I want to be a prime minister. I want to be a philosopher. I want to be an astronaut with no real sense of why you want to do that other than that it just looks cool. But part of the maturing process is actually realizing why it is that it would be valuable to do that and whether or not you are the suitable person to do it rather than just remaining in that stage of having the idealization of the image and chasing it just for the sake of it being a pretty image. Yeah. 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 I think so. It's, there are lots of stories of, let's see, people uh, who didn't want to go into a position of authority because they saw that to do it correctly, they would have to make all kinds of sacrifices. Like people who don't want to go into authority for let's say selfish reasons, uh, they they often do it with difficulty. There are, there, there are tons of stories of let's say people who were made bishops against their wills or pope against their wills. Like they didn't want to do it, and they often turned out to be the best ones at the job because they, they knew the reason why they were reluctant to do it is because they knew full well the self-sacrificial role that it would entail. Uh, and we don't have as many, let's say, okay, it may be harder now to see good examples of this. I don't know, but we, we talked about all the different layers of masculinity that have been removed. And if all we see is sort of the, the state that is so far off, or the, the position of power that is so far off, it's easy to, let's say, not see that often the people that are there are actually doing something much more difficult than we realize. Like Jordan often says this, like if you talk with people who are actually running companies, like it's super difficult. Like you don't necessarily want to do this. Like they, they technically have power, but they're also responsible for the, the livelihoods of the tons of people and they have to work like mad and they're aware that they, they have to sacrifice their time quite a lot or I mean some of the people could lose their job and so on. So it's, it's easy to project stuff once you like make your ideal so far removed. And as you said, it's probably like a normal part of growing up, especially in a world where those positions are so far off that to, to see it so much. Uh, I'm curious, I have some question for you. Uh, Cause you've been doing men's work for a while and what do you see are sort of the main issues uh, for men typically these days? Is it the lack of role models or whatever? Like what's well, your that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, there's uh, there's different kind of types or different groups. So like one group I'm mindful of, it's like middle-aged men, say in their 40s and 50s, who have lived quite successful middle-class um, family lives, but are kind of getting to this midlife point and starting to be like, is there more than this? So like, is there 
a religious dimension to life? Is there a uh, exploring things like spirituality or psychedelics or wondering my relationship, you know, it was fun in the beginning and then we had kids and now we live together and we're just kind of partners. Do I want to stay this like this forever? Is my home life actually happy or can we make it more sexy? Can we make it more, um, more exciting? So that's one group. There's, there's probably, I find that interesting just to be sure. So I mean that most of these men are like their family is actually still together. It's just that they don't, like they, they're not divorced or, or that stuff, but they still like they still want more. I guess there are points where they want more than what they have achieved. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's like they've done the thing that you're supposed to do almost, but there's the sense that this perhaps isn't enough, and that the the relationship isn't isn't fully nourishing or isn't fully sustaining. Sometimes it's almost like we're still together just because <laughs> because we're together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. I, I think so. There's a sexual component to that as well. Like I know some of the guys involved with, uh, with the manifesto. Some of the guys have been, have gone and learned Tantra after having been in a, a relationship for like a decade or two. They actually thought, right can we take this to the next level? Can we go into a space where we're now going to explore open relationships or fucking other people, kinky fantasies, etc. within a sexual, within a safe container. There are guys who I've met who have basically just decided that having been through the marriage and raising kids, actually it's time for that marriage to be over and to, to go on and explore something new and then finding themselves in the the contemporary digital dating landscape. So like I said, that's, that's one demographic. There's also the younger men. And I think younger men, most of us have passed through the eye of the Peterson needle, if you will, have been exposed to Jordan Peterson in some way or another. And are kind of thinking there's, there's more to life than just chasing girls. There's, a desire for, for religion, for purpose. You know, I think purpose is actually a big driver amongst men, like meaning and purpose. How can I find what it is that I'm here to do and how can I then do it? Right. That's interesting. And would you say that, okay, so on one end, one thing that we see is, okay, in the previous generation, there was a, there is a desire for something higher but it's more pronounced in the younger people. Uh, so for the older group, we also said that, okay, they did have, fa- have a family. Uh, for the younger group, do you say that like this whole idea of having a family is an issue or is it uh, like similar to the previous generation? That's hard to say because I didn't see the previous generation when they were kids. But I think from from my just observations of my generation, and I mean, I, we're pretty much the same generation, right? Like I'm 25. I don't know how old you are, but... I'm 27. Right. Yeah. I think certainly amongst me and my friends, we are much more questioning or skeptical of the traditional family structure. Although there probably are men, younger men within manifesto who have kind of like been through that reaction or rebelling stage and are actually now coming back and thinking, okay, maybe I I actually am interested in in marriage or having a kid or like having a long term relationship. And I've also met um, a few women online who are kind of in a similar position, actually, like young women who decided, no, I want to get married and have a kid, which is a real like that's totally against what the kind of mainstream feminist aspiration is, which is like, go forth, be a career, be as powerful and as successful as any man could be. Now, there seems to be at least in a in a, in a section of people, of young people, a desire to re-explore the traditional structure. But my also sense is that just going to a perhaps more traditional structure without an orientation towards something more religious or transcendent will lead to the same position perhaps that middle-aged people are finding themselves in, which is like, well, we did what our parents did, which was got married and have kids, but now where do we go? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree. There's a, there's a 
normal progression that in traditional societies you would see and even let's say within because I'm, I'm going to get married in like five months now so my fiance and i have been doing like reading and studying for for this and we're, we're catholic so we mainly explore within this uh, this this intellectual tradition of course but there's this idea of different stages as you sort of talked about earlier uh i think you referenced an orthodox priest uh but you know once you okay so you 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 do get married with something higher in mind uh, it's not sort of just to do what your parents have done and once you're able to get married you should you know, have children once you're able to take care of them you jump to a higher level you don't just once your family is done you don't sort of just stay there you need to fight, find higher level objectives uh, so people will get more involved into their community some people will become missionaries um, and so on and i think one one huge thing is So it's about returning to more traditional ways of doing things. I think it's, in many ways, it's harder, but we have more temptations now, let's say, because there, there's some stuff that only works if you sort of do it all out, I think. Um, for instance, if you look at, okay, there are lots of people getting married now still, but I mean, half of them are getting divorced. And even within people who are more religious, like they will, for instance, I know that um, even some, some demographics of Catholics who are very serious uh, still get divorced at almost the same rate as uh, like lay people. But like there's one special demographic that gets divorced at a very low rate. Uh, and it's the people who really go all out. Like they, because the, the, the ideal, in traditional societies is, is really high like even within a marriage you are like not able to use contraception for instance and that the, the people will respect that within catholic uh families the, the, the divorce rates go down to like five percent something very low and the satisfaction rate is extremely high and that's because like it seems it seems kind of silly when you just like think about contraception by itself it seems like it just like doesn't do anything, but it has a really powerful impact in terms of the narrative. Because what happens like in practice when couples decide to go with no contraception and typically what they'll have to do is uh, something called natural family planning. So it, what, you have to just abstain during certain periods and during other periods then, uh, then relations probably won't lead to children. So you're still open to children because Apparently it's super scary. I'm not married yet, so I, I can't validate, but apparently it's super scary. Even if let's say, you know that you're technically in an unfertile period uh, to not be using any contraceptive, like you still know that right now, you know, as you're, let's say, making love to your wife, you know that, okay, I may have to sacrifice myself, you know, for my wife and the children that are going to come of it. And similarly, you know that your wife is trusting you that a children may come of that and uh, that she, she trusts that you'll stay. So it's a very powerful, binding agent between you and, and your wife and it pulls you right away to something that is much higher like you're not just let's say showing your affection to one another right now you're making a long-term commitment so you're, you're doing something highly spiritual during that encounter and let's say even like throughout the month where you have it you know you you have to discuss your different periods you have, you always have to think okay um uh, like are we ready to bring another child into the world right now like Really, sexual relations become something deeply meaningful. So you don't have to like explore kinky stuff or whatever. But it's always super serious. <laughs> uh, and you know, so I think in in traditional families, and I think the stats bear this out now that the, the families who go all out with this kind of stuff, that low divorce rates, they're highly satisfied with their marriages. Uh, once they, you know, after all of this this growth that they're able to do, once they get older, they also have lots of wisdom to share to younger people. They can be very useful in their community. So like you don't hit the same kind of plateau, I think, in your midlife. Um, yeah, so that's what I would answer. I don't know if you found that helpful or convincing. Oh, no, it's like I, I love, <laughs> of course, I love talking and thinking about sex. Who doesn't? But I think it is one of the, uh, the big questions. In fact, I think it's like a big trauma in society. It's like we had 
the contraceptive pill. And that's such a radical shift in how we live and relate to one another that 60 years on, we still can't even talk about it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, like so innocuous, but like once you look at it at a larger scale, it's so huge. It's, a, it's enormous impact. And we, we are, we're barely like able to broach the subject. Like it's, it's like we know that we're touching something huge. Precisely. There's this great quote in the uh, British comedy TV show Peep Show where one of the characters is like, look, the 60s happened and now sex is fine. And he says it really bitterly, <laughs> but it kind of hits the nail on the head. It's like, right, the 60s did happen. We had the, the contraceptive revolution. We've had the sexual revolution. Sex is now fine. With a little bit of precaution, you can kind of do it wherever and with whoever you want. And there's very little social approach for it and very little biological consequences. Now, fucking what? And as far as I can tell, I think there's an interesting movement that some people are going towards the kind of the more traditional approach to it, like you've outlaid there. I think that is an option. I think that's probably not where we're going to go, at least in the mainstream. I, I think myself included, I like contraception too much to just give up on it. But I think there is like an important synthesis perhaps of relearning how to approach sexuality as a very serious thing, if not the most serious thing in life to take it from being like incredibly serious to then being hedonism, enjoy, be sexually free, do whatever you want. Like sexuality is your road to freedom, which is actually what I think a lot of the kind of sixties and post actually like took on. It's like, if you can just fuck around lots, then you will be a free subject. This is certainly kind of what the feminism adopted. It's like an empowered women can just fuck around like a man does. But now there's a sense of like, no, the lesson to learn is like, you will never be free of your sexuality. You have to learn to live with this thing, which is scary and monstrous and more powerful than anything else you know in life. And it will give you amazing experiences and terrible experiences if you're not careful with it. And to treat it with that level of respect. Uh, increasingly, I think the way to approach sexuality in the post contraceptive world, it's like an art form and an art form that has to be incredibly well respected. It's interesting to bring in art because with you know, increasingly art has become disconnected from the world too. Uh, and I think it's really parallel, you know, with contraception, you've turned something that used to be a deeply spiritual exercise. One of the deepest sexual, uh, one of the deepest spiritual exercises you could do. We've turned it into something that is, that is pleasurable uh, at worst. And at best, let's say a, a show of affection to someone. So we, we took it out of its cosmic context, for instance, and it's dangerous because we, we take, let's say, something that is one of the most pleasurable experiences we can have, and we divorce it from the I, the super I meaning that it's supposed to have. So, and if we start playing with the relationship between pleasure and meaning, we're playing a dangerous game because in general, we are starting to mess with the hierarchy of what we find meaningful and pleasurable in general. Like if we mess with the, like the, the deepest thing, uh, we start to mess with everything that rests on top of it. And something similar happened with art because art didn't used to be just a, like a hobby that some professionals do and that other people go watch on, on, on cinema screens or that a tiny per proportion of people go see in museums. It used to be that some, something that everybody did, like everything was meant to be artistic in the sense of bringing different things together, bringing beauty and purpose together. So I see this sort of, the disinter disincarnation between pleasure and meaning. Mm. I think it's parallel to what's going on in, in art, but I do. I mean, I, I feel for people who, let's say, can't go the fully traditional route because it's, I mean, it's almost like jumping into another world. Like things have changed so much during the 60s and it seemed, it takes so long and it takes such a, a big network of people also to support, to try to jump back into something traditional that, yeah, I don't know exactly what to do about it, except just trying to see how, <laughs> try to say how I see things. Wow. Mm. Yeah. 
I think it's like, it's funny, this thing about pleasure and meaning. I'm certainly mindful of the fact that even prior to the sexual revolution and contraception, whorehouses and brothels have existed forever. So there have at least been <laughs> men and women who have been doing sexuality just for pleasure, probably more men and then the whores and leaving the, uh, the women, the good girls who are to become wives and mothers to, uh, to perhaps worry about sexuality more. Um, but you are right that there's this kind of like this interesting relationship between pleasure and meaning. Sometimes I find myself thinking, and I'm curious what your thoughts on this, that like Christian thinking can tend to distinguish the two when there isn't actually an opposition between them. Like sometimes the meaningful things can be very pleasurable or by contrast, sometimes things that are just incredibly pleasurable can be very meaningful as well. And this is like, for example, my inroads back into contemporary sexuality is like, if it's like, okay, if it's going to be an incredibly pleasurable thing, how can we still approach that pleasure itself as an incredibly meaningful and spiritual thing. It's like with that kind of high level of gratitude that I have this body and I can feel these incredible sensations with another person. And I can feel this kind of deep intimate moment with this person, whether or not it's in, in the context of a long lifetime relationship or just a one night stand in a hotel, there's still, it, it is still experienced as a doorway into something higher and more beautiful than self. And here again, I think is where, where Tantra is interesting because I think this is pretty much the, the point of Tantra is trying to turn sexuality itself into a yoga or a spiritual practice, learning to be a, a powerful lover so as to serve your partner's sexual pleasure in a way that is actually like worshipping the universe within them and within yourself. I think that's definitely better than what we see uh, generally elsewhere. I see that typically... You would have this within traditional marriages too. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the 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 split between, let's say, pleasure and meaning, you definitely see it in certain branches of Christianity. Uh, you see it in, uh, like, uh, in Puritanism. You can see it popping up before. Uh, and the, because Christianity is so radical, let's say, about all of the illusions that are in the world and all of the vices that we are, it's tempting to go Gnostic, to see that fundamentally, like the world is a huge illusion and uh, we need to pierce through something behind. But Christianity has always judged this as heretical. And ultimately, like pleasure, the most pleasurable things and the most meaningful things are supposed to be brought together. It's because of our sins, basically, that they are not. But we, we, the ideal is always to bring them back together. And that's what we must strive for. Even, let's see, the the, the ideal, I think even the most pleasure that we see in, in, Christian, in terms of Christian experiences, for instance, is not, and I think this, is, this will be true even in other traditions, but it's not even sexuality. It's like the mystical union that mystics have, you know, the, the, the union with God directly that some mystics are able to have. That's even better. Like some, some people are just monks who spend their whole lives just in prayer and in ecstasy, and they're having even more pleasure than the, you know, the, the playboy who yeah, is having sex with how many beautiful women he wants. So we, we must try to strive to bring meaning and pleasure together. And it works better than we think. I have. Like if, if you, yeah, I, I'm trying to think if I know, I don't, I don't know stats on this per se. I know that you, you can see that the level of happiness of different groups, like going down through time. I think women have been like reporting less happiness over time. I think, I think in men, it depends. It depends on the countries too, but I wouldn't, Yeah, I, it's, it seems, I don't have sort of a comprehensive argument here, but it seems more plausible to me that if you strive to bring pleasure and meaning together, like a, a, a likely endpoint will be something traditional, in fact. Uh, so I think it's a good, like, I think I'm not, yeah, I'm not too surprised that Tantra becomes attractive to people. Because uh, I think it's a good starting point. It's much better than just the sort of meaningless freedom that lots of people have today. But, and I wonder, like, I'd be curious to see where this ends up. Like, if you keep taking it further and exploring it, like, where 
like how traditional <laughs> will it get? My hypothesis would, would be that it will get more and more traditional, but yeah, I'll be curious. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm no expert in it at all. I mean, I think some of the, the Tantra people who I, I know, I mean, they tend to live actually quite, they, they have open relationships and they have sex with lots of partners, but sometimes or quite often also have a primary partner. It's not like the total abandonment of of pair bonding, mm-hmm. but there is just a, I think it's this decoupling of sexuality from perhaps the pair bond, mm-hmm. because there is this, this connection in how we think about sexuality, like a very deep one connected uh, to feelings of jealousy and envy and perhaps i know we've not got much time left but this kind of brings us into Girardian territory Mm -hmm. that the intensity of the relationship with a pair bond partner creates this sense of i want that person purely for me and i want that person's desire to be purely for me and if that person has desires outside of me, or especially if that person acts up, acts out on desires outside of me, mm-hmm. that destroys the entire fabric of what we have. And it's kind of understandable that that emerged in a um, in an evolutionary context, as the sense like if you go fucking people outside of your pair bond, then you're gonna <laughs> have kids outside of your pair bond, and that's gonna destabilize the entire social structure. Unless you're already living in some kind of primitive tribal commune, which essentially we haven't lived in for thousands of years. But just because there is this almost biological reason to avoid sex outside of the pair bond, which then translates into a an emotional aversion to the partner's infidelity, the partner's sexuality outside of the pair bond. We still also can't help experiencing sexual drives outside of our pair bond. This is the kind of great paradox and perhaps struggle and battle of sexual contradiction is that we're both monogamous in terms of or most people are monogamous in terms of how we relate emotionally, but non-monogamous just in terms of how we experience sexual desire. Mm -hmm. And the traditional marriage is, it's one solution to it. Mm -hmm. But with, uh, with the contraceptive revolution, it's no longer the only solution. So now it almost seems a, a matter of, of inevitability that we will experiment with more and new forms, despite the fact that this is essentially incredibly dangerous territory, mm-hmm. precisely because of the jealousy and envy. It's mm-hmm. like it's still in many places a crime of passion is considered in a court of law a, a lesser sentence than, say, a typical murder. So if someone murders their partner because they found them in bed with a dun- another person, your sentence would be less than if you just murdered them in cold blood, precisely because it's recognized mm-hmm. how traumatizing it can be to have that that link broken, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, go on, please. Yeah. So I think, yeah, we're sort of seeing two, two tracks. Uh, so... I want to you know. I see the traditional track on my end, and I see, let's say, what you're doing as okay. It's it's an open way because of contraception, basically. But I see, like from my viewpoint, there's almost no way that this can possibly work. Even just contraception in regular couples, I think, like breaks the grand narrative meaning that I was talking about earlier, and then. I, I, Seems to me like you're just going to compound the troubles <laughs> if you're bringing other people. But I also see that it's not like I have a, like a, maybe within a theological framework, I could try to make a definitive statement. But if, let's say, I'm trying to stay within a secular framework for the purposes of a conversation, it's not like I have a knockdown argument against, that, that, against the possibility that somewhere in the search space, you'll find something stable. But like, so, but yeah, so I guess from my viewpoint, it just seems highly unlikely that this branch will work. But and then from your viewpoint, I guess you, you probably acknowledge that the traditional one can work, but you find it, I guess, unlikely that many people will decide to follow it nowadays. 
Would that be sort of your intuition? Like, why? What, what doesn't attract you, let's say, in the more traditional side? It's interesting. So I'm actually in a monogamous relationship, mm -hmm. but I think what what I find myself thinking is it's like if I'm with my girlfriend now for the rest of my life, am I never going to have sex with another person again? Mm -hmm. Or am I never going to get to have sex with someone who isn't like a white European girl? Mm -hmm. And that worries you? Yeah, there's an element of just wanting to taste more of experience. Mm -hmm. Then, then there's also the element, this is perhaps not like where I'm at, but it's an interesting perspective that one of uh, a friends of mine who's quite involved in Tantra told me, he said, <laughs> you take a secular person and you throw them into like open relationships and tantric sexuality. They have no choice but to become religious because otherwise it would destroy them. <laughs> it's like you need your faith in God because everything, it is way fucking harder like you mean i think it's so much more chaotic i think it puts so much more pressure and so that is actually a road to to god <laughs> dangerous one <laughs> <laughs> a fucking dangerous one <laughs> yeah but i get the yeah the idea that our desires always going to point us outwards even saints keep struggling with 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 lusts and all kinds of, of issues still. Just, I guess, is that you know, Jordan's idea that you have to pick your sacrifice and stick to it. Because overall, it does seem uh, that people are more satisfied in the end if they, let's say, stick to someone, uh, uh, have a family, try then to take care of as many people as they can, than if they sort of let the desires more roam. Uh, it, no, it's... Even in, it's, it's so, and it's so radical in traditional religions that the idea that even like the happiest people will be the ascetics, like the people who are basically, who feed basically none of their physical pleasures, like people who, who fast for almost all of their life. People who are sometimes depicted as like skeletons in, in, in icons because they just don't sort of feed their passions, but who are like in spiritual ecstasy and in, in traditional societies, let's say the people who are married would recognize those ascetics and the monks, for instance, as higher than them and as having a more meaningful and even pleasurable lives uh, than them. But not everyone can do that sort of stuff. And if you try to do it and you can't, you'll just get destroyed and it's going to be worse. But like, one, one thing that helps, and this, this fits with Girard, René Girard's idea is that we tend to pick up the desires of others and model our desires after them. There's a good expression for that in English. Like you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And like one way to help with, let's see, monogamy was to know that the, the, the ascetics are better than you. Like ideally you would have the same desires that they have. It's just that you can't do it because you're human. And you know, the, all of the highest figures in Christianity were all virgins. Like the, um, in, in the Old Testament, like to prepare the way, people used to be married and have children and so on. Some pe people were often polygamous, but as you progressed, you went into a point where all of the, the highest figures, like Christ, like uh, uh, his father and mother, like John the Baptist, they were all virgins. And they all had the most meaningful and pleasurable lives. And we try to aspire to that, but because we can't all do it, then we have monogamous marriages. And that's, that's a form of asceticism. And Lots of people would sin. People would have, uh, let's see, people would not have full relationships with mar within their marriages. People would go to brothels. There would be homosexuality going on. And like people would, would forgive those people. They would still go to communion and so on. Like it was sort of accepted that this was part of the world, but that we should all aspire to be the ascetics and that we should model our desires after them. I should, I should pretty much go. But uh, <laughs> anyways, I thought this was fun. And uh, let me know, do you have anything else you'd like to say or ask right now? Um, only that I'm not convinced that the virgins have the most fun and the most ecstasy. But <laughs> other than this, other than this, now it's been fucking awesome meeting you and talking to you, man. Yeah. So this was a real pleasure, Owen. And uh, yeah, have a good one. I'm sure we In can. Fact, before you go, um, where can people find you online? 
Oh yeah, well, um, I am the chief editor of the Symbolic World blog, so the symbolicworld.com, and I also have a YouTube channel. If you Google me, uh, JP Marceau, you'll find it. Wicked, and I'll put the links to that in the description as well. Cool. Thank you, Owen. Nice one, man. Take care of yourself. Thanks for listening. And once again, if you like what we're doing, please like and subscribe. 